Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here uh, for the seventh time, I think, at this conference. So I think Linz is not in the room, but I'm not sure why, he, why he's having me. Like every year he, here as a speaker. Uh, my name is Milos. I'm head of delivery at Think Solver. Uh, if this is not your first time at the conference, you probably heard about Think Solver. We are a small company. Actually, let me go to that slide. Uh, we, we actually were a small company founded in Belgrade by my college friend and me. Currently, Think Solver, a uh, member of a SECO group, a SECO Southeastern Europe, so we joined the SECO beginning of this year officially. Currently, 40 people, and we are basically a data company. So we are a company that's focusing on building data products, whatever that means, whatever you have on your mind when you think about data products, it's probably something we are, we are working on. And today I will be focusing uh, mostly on the things that we are and the initiatives we have in banking and what's our approach to banking industry. Because as you probably know, uh, ASECO and, and uh, SECO Southeastern Europe are quite present in the banking. So we are basically taking advantage of all, of all the knowledge that the group has in banking and our experience in data handling and tackling vast amounts of data to build amazing products. Basically, we are uh, hiring data engineers, data scientists, and other supporting roles. And when I say I'm a head of delivery, I really think my position is to support the people that are working at ThinkSolver, at ASECO, to really deliver the insights, actionable insights from the data. So that's our mission. And our industries that we are working on uh, except the banking and finance are retail, telecommunications, and, and HR. So many things that I will mention today, they are not uh, referring only to banking, but also to, to some other industries. Uh, the, the previous speak, speaker to, uh, was say, telling us something about McKinsey and their research. So I will show you another one, like uh, what is the potential of using advanced analytics data in banking? Uh, these are three use cases that I extracted from some McKinsey paper about some banks that applied analytics to their area of business and achieved some results. So one, one European bank uh, used ML to predict which customers are most likely to churn. They imposed the strategy how to communicate to these people what they can offer to them, and they reduced churn by 15%. Another bank from US, they uh, applied some machine learning models to identify patterns where basically the salespeople are offering discounts that are not needed uh, private bankers to their customers and they achieved 8% revenue increase and one Asian bank they used micro segmentation in combination with next best offer and recommendation system to basically personalize and tailor the offer to their customers and they increased the likelihood for a customer to buy by three times which these results really seem impressive but we don't hear a lot about them. And when I was preparing for this presentation, it wasn't that easy for me to find these numbers. Like, what is the actual value and what is the actual benefit that, end of the day, some banks are extracting from the data? So uh, this is the, the main focus for my, for my talk uh, for today. I will exp try to explain what are my and our thoughts on this and how we are trying to help our customers to be better at this. Of course, we know that the banks are slow. They are like big old elephants that we, all of us, have uh, like the need. We must work, work with them, whether we are businesses, private uh, individuals, or, or something else. So uh, the tricky part when it comes to analytics or bu building data products in, in banking is that, let's start with tech. Information systems are legacy. In m most of the banks, we have core banking systems that were built like 30, 40, even 50 years ago. They're still working. It's expensive to replace them. So all these systems are quite legacy, but they really serve a purpose. So it's difficult to replace them. Uh, on the other hand, all the information systems are quite complex because we had different things that are popular at certain times, which were developed, implemented, millions of customers are served by, by those imp, uh, applications. So the whole relation between them is complex. And data architecture, for in many cases, it's not adequate to deal with really vast amount of data that we, are, that we have today. So when, where we measure like every transaction, every interaction that our customer unrelated to industry has with our, our company, so the whole architecture, it's not adequate to really handle all this amount of data because the banking systems are in most cases built around accounting, finance, 
about the core business, not about the data, data scientists, data engineers, and data formats that we need to perform our analytics. So one of the, what's our thought on this, how we try to, to approach this challenge? So uh, when we are talking about such systems, one of the things that we are imposing here is trying to implement APIs and the interfaces that could help the banks and other, other companies to be better at using their data. It's not always the best solution, like let's go, let's, ruin, let's uh, destroy everything that we have, build from scratch, and then start from there. So the, the, uh, the approach to getting over this challenge is basically building the interfaces on top of the existing systems, seeing how this data could be exported, extracted from one system, put into the other where data scientists and engineers can use them. Uh, then plan and build for concrete use cases. And this is, uh, since my background is data engineering, I think this is the area where, uh, let me just check if this is working, yeah, not sure if you can see, but uh, why Hadoop and the big data as we had it like a few years ago was failing because we had technology that was promised that will resolve all of our analytics issues, but it's, in most cases it was never built around the use cases. So it was built around the technology. We needed like dozens of people to control the complex Hadoop ecosystem and handle vast amount of data. So nobody was talking about the use cases. Why do we need certain data? So it, in many cases, it ended up building silos where we had some data isolated in another system. And then architecture efforts that are built around smart integrations. So we don't have to change probably for some use cases like customer segmentation or, or product recommendation. We don't need to change the whole systems to be able to get the information that we want to our customers. So, but the main question here is how we build the architecture with smart integrations that is sustainable, that will allow us to get all of these results to the end customer, to the end user of the application so we can, we can basically use it for, for business. Then if we, uh, crucial talent is lacking, of course. Uh, we really have, especially in Serbia, I think right now we are facing uh, the fight between the companies to get the best people uh, for the job. Yesterday when I came to the conference, I noticed that we had a bunch of different companies, like all the stands, all of us that are hiring, but not many candidates in the audience, which from my perspective as a hiring manager, it's a bit frightening. But crucial talent is lacking. And that is especially uh, for all businesses, for Co uh, companies like banks. So there are many things how we can uh, help, how the banks can think about basically getting the, the great talent and getting the capabilities they need uh, to build the, the things that are needed to be built. Uh, one of the challenges is that uh, most of these cha changes are not planned uh, by delivery models. So Many companies just start employing data engineers, data scientists without the idea like what, the, what is the delivery model? So how we scale the solution? How do we nurture and acquire talent, talent, both internal and external? How we actually build new people into data scientists, data engineers, or is that something we do at all? And of course, focusing on internal talent and, ta ta and partnerships. So for many things that could be do done in-house, but also looking to the partners, to the network where there are people who, who already solve these challenges or know, know how to approach them. Of course, priorities are in many cases widespread because it's quite fancy these days, uh, actually for the past few years, to talk about data strategies, digitalization, digital transformation, etc. But in order for any analytics project to be successful, I think it's really crucial like, to have this put as one of the strategies or as a priority because if such project is not a priority, to any business unit, business line, to anyone in the company, at the end of the day, it won't be done. It won't get the results that we need. Uh, in many cases, investments and the results are mismatched. So another challenge that we put a lot of money into some initiative and uh, when we measure like six months later, the results are not there. So they're, they're missing. So uh, from my experience, uh, not only for banking, but also for other industries, what was always a good solution to this challenge was focus really on the low hanging fruit, like don't invest billions or millions or whatever into building like such initiatives like let's start with low hanging fruit like let's find one use case where we can really show the value where we can go to the management to the board if it's not a strategic strategic let's say plan and show them on a simple use case what could be the value of analytics of machine learning in ai of course think big start small and 
the most important thing is, of course, like let's think how we measure. Let's focus on the use cases that are measurable, that at the end of the day, when someone asks, and they will ask, like what is the value of this model so we can really measure what is the impact to the bottom line, to the user, to the, to the business itself. And of course, the willingness to change is in many cases missing. So we really need to be cautious that we really preach and that we practice uh, that we preach. Uh, the previous uh, speaker, he was telling about like how uh, with his company, how the, the board members are reflecting to this issue. Like how do we, how can we show by example that we really believe in this data strategy, that we believe in building such projects, products and, and solutions. So all of these challenges that we saw here basically lead to cases where we have the slow delivery. So we are spending a lot of time to deliver something. In many cases in banks, for example, most of the time is spent integrating some systems with other systems. So 80%, there is some research that 80% of the time on such projects it goes to data integration, which is crazy. I mean, it, it shouldn't take that much time. We have impact on the bottom line that is not sufficient. Scaling is quite difficult. ROI in many cases is limited or at least unclear. Integration is painful at the end of the day, like no one is happy. So we had like a d promising data strategy, data driven business, but the results are not there. So the rest of my talk would be basically focusing on these three more technical uh, stuff. Like how can we actually could data management and handling our, our data help us like to overcome at least these uh, technical challenges. Uh, so uh, this is just the brief overview of the data architectures and what they were looking over time. So you don't have really, ha really don't have to read over this. Uh, but at the beginning, we had like relational databases, data warehouses that were built just to show aggregated data to show some reports to the end users. But we were missing many information that, are, that is needed uh, in today's world, like events, like what, which interactions we had with the customer and what was the sequence uh, of events, etc. Then there were technologies, I already mentioned Hadoop, that was promising to solve all of the issues that we always had, like with handling the data, like scale and uh, really processing vast amounts of data when basically the memory became affordable, CPU became affordable, but we again ended up building data silos. So our approach at this moment, and I think this is where most of the data world is, is to building something different. Like let's try to put composable platforms. Like let's really focus only on the data that we truly need and let's put into our analytics platform like only the components and modules that we will be needing at the end of the day that we will use for, for any use case. Uh, so that's the current aim at uh, ThingSolver and, and uh, uh, most, where most of our effort goes is to building the scalable and flexible architecture that we can support any use case we needed, but we don't want to support them like out of the box, like provide dozens of components and, and applications to the customer and they end up not using them. Uh, this is uh, the platform side. So I just put here a few components that we are providing here. So uh, the most of, of our platform is built around Kubernetes as the runtime where we can run any application, whether it's API, it's data pipeline, ETL, data warehouse. So this is the uh, solution that we ended up like running with. Uh, we use data lake as a storage layer where we can put data unstructured, structured, formatted, semi-formatted, so in any form that we need. And then we build the, we add these building blocks on top. So if a customer needs channels, we have channels integration. If a customer needs GDPR, uh, to, to GDPR component to handle with the data, we add only that component. If we need monitoring, in most cases we do need them. So we just add those components. So this is uh, how the, the, not only the thing solver, but also how uh, market thinks about the, the approach to, to handling data architecture. Uh, I think this is something that uh, Gartner refers to as data fabric, something similar. But the main idea is like, let's only build a system around the things that we truly need, that we need for use case. And if we need something like additionally, we can add that later. With this approach, we are basically saving a lot of efforts for the IT guys, for any technical people that really need to integrate these systems and to maintain them. And we are also spending uh, like a lot of, t uh, saving a lot of time uh, for basically avoiding this, uh, these integrations. Uh, 
Uh, this is one example uh, for such use case. So since we are talking about the banking sector, we have many applications that are generating this data. So we have uh, mobile and online apps. We have, of course, core banking system where data is coming from. Uh, we have CRM where different actions and different interactions are persisted. Uh, then we have some information that is publicly available or online or provided by the, uh, the regulator or some other companies. So we have like really vast amounts of data to, to integrate. So uh, in order to really make it easier for our customers to integrate all of this information, we basically ho based on all, on our all of our system around smart integrations. Like if we are integrating APIs, let's build connectors that we can use to integrate such APIs. In terms of the architecture uh, further on, like what do we do with the data, uh, we have the, uh, I mentioned the data lake part, where, uh, which basically compo uh, is structured from object storage layer where we can persist uh, like historical data that is aggregated, that is not re needed in real time. And we have the streaming layer that basically provides us the capability to process any event in real time where we really care about that. For example, customer is at, is at the ATM and we want to offer something to the customer while he's still on the ATM. So we need this uh, top side of the picture to be able really to serve this information in real time to the end user so this information can be used for, for our business. And at the end, so as I mentioned, like the, uh, basically the smart integrations on this side, it also reflects to CRM, origination, channels, and other applications that are used in banking. Like let's really build the connectors so that any application that is used, whether it's for marketing purposes or something else, could be integrated easily by connector whenever possible. So this information could be served by applications, mobile apps, web apps, or, or something else. So uh, the path to better data management to really enable uh, advanced analytics, data science, machine learning at full scale relies on several, several, let's say, main points that we focus on. So first of all, I mentioned this already is composable analytics. Like let's really build the analytics that is fit to use cases and to business cases and not to technology, not to be overwhelmed uh, with different components that, ne that needs to be measured. When ThinkSolver was founded as a company, we started working a lot with Hadoop up to the point where when we realized that it won't be sustainable because for any customer that we had using Hadoop, we would need like two engineers, system administrators, to really maintain such platforms. So this really wasn't a good approach. And to be honest, I'm happy that Hadoop is dead today. Uh, it's, it's great that we don't have anyone from Cloudera or companies like that because this, this is technology that only introduced complexity and it didn't showcase the value that was promised. Another important thing like to achieve the composable analytics is using containers, building blocks, so it doesn't have to be containers. This is just architectural decision that we made. It was easier for, for us. It really enabled us to use different technologies because a thing solver all, actually, all of us are using Python. In a SQL, we have different technologies uh, like uh, .NET, Java, other applications. So containers really enabled us to build just these building blocks so two systems could communicate without having to care about which technology they are using behind. In order to achieve this, we used the open API as standard. Like, let's use APIs to standardize the way how each service uh, communicates to another doesn't matter whether it's machine learning or it's uh, some application or just the API that serves the recommendation to the end customer. And uh, since I already mentioned I'm a data engineer, this was one of the most important things that we focus on, like really build, uh, utilizing the data ops culture, like really focusing on rapid innovation, experimentation, like in every phase of the project. So uh, when we are working on a product, it's never done. So there's always something to work on, but we really, through those practices, try to focus on continuous delivery and experimentation so that at any phase when we are working on something, we can deliver new value to the customer, deliver something good for the product that uh, at the end of the day will bring some value to, to someone. Uh, then of course, uh, taking care about the data quality, which is uh, in any industry, one of the greatest challenges, like really making sure that all the information, all the data that we have, that we use for analytics, is good and uh, 
this is definitely one of the trickiest part because it involves uh, a lot of tech, tech skills uh, for data engineers, for data scientists, but also where most of the, let's say, customers' domain expertise is imposed because at the end of the day, like uh, people from the, from the from my perspective, from the customer side, they are the ones that know what's wrong with the data, where the things could go wrong. So we are focusing a lot on bringing this data quality uh, in such a way that it's sustainable, that we, when we load the data from a new system, like we have a new batch of daily loaded data, that we know it's correct and it's reliable. And then when we communicate this information to certain decision maker, we know that this information is true. And of course, having the measurements, monitor, monitoring and transparency of the results. Because I think at the end of the day, we were talking a lot during the conference about ethics and basically the trust in AI and analytics. I think the most important thing uh, uh, in building data product and delivering some insights from analytics is to be transparent to the customer. It's not uh, so bad if the customer doesn't see, for example, when they, if the pipeline didn't finish, so the customer doesn't see the most recent data in their dashboards or stuff like that, because it's technology, like maybe the pipe, the data arrived later, something is wrong with the pipeline or similar, but it's really bad if the customer is not aware of it. So we are with every dashboard that we build, we really try to communicate to the customer like to the end user, this is the data that, that you're looking at. So if you are missing some information, for example, the, yesterday's data didn't arrive, I think it's important to communicate that to the customer so they know what they are uh, basing their decision on. And you can see here like just the high level architecture of, of such use cases that we have in, in banking. On one side, data sources, then con container runtime, in our case, Kubernetes, where we'll run different applications for different cases. And on the end, what is our main focus with ASECO, with ASE, is to uh, integrate, because for us it's a low-hanging fruit, uh, to integrate with the existing applications. So on the right side, you can see some of the ASECO uh, products for banking. So for us, it was the low-hanging fruit. Like we have some analytics, we have some knowledge from about data, data processing, machine learning. And we have some applications that are used by the customer. So for us, it was a low hanging fruit just to integrate these systems together. So uh, we can really feed the information to the, to the users into their existing screens, existing applications, and not have to build like the whole apps from the beginning so just the users could use their information. Uh, in general, to sum up just like what, is, what are the main uh, points for unlocking the full potential uh, of the advanced analytics in banking, uh, first of all, analytical data platform. So the whole point here is just thinking about the smart integrations, smart connectors, transparency, whether it's open API or some other way, but definitely a way to showcase to the users, in our case developers, like how this information could be consumed further on, how it can be used in CRM, in marketing automation tool, in something else. So the main point of this is to cut the delivery time. So not in all cases we need to go and replace the whole complex systems that we have in the company, but maybe it is a solution just to build smart data, in data integration connectors so that it could be fed from one place to another. Data quality and validation really enables us to communicate to the end users and to the management and to the customers that all the decisions that we make based on this approach are reliable so that our data is checked, that we see that we don't have any missing data, we don't have inaccurate data. So we are sure that whatever we are focusing on our analytics on is accurate. And that's an ongoing process because always the data changes, uh, application changes, so there are different changes on many levels that at the end of the day affect data sets that we are working with. But the main idea is like to always validate and check for the quality and check what are the results and the inputs that we have related to our models so that, that we know the decisions made at the end of the day are accurate. Orchestration and CI CD are one of the best practices that we introduced in ThingSolver, I think, ever, because it really helped us to focus on development, focus on uh, use cases, focus on this side, so we don't have to take care about the pipeline's uh, runtime and whether the application ran or it didn't run or how long that did it take. So it really helped us like to overcome these tech challenges in handling dozens of pipelines. Uh, 
I'm li literally saying like thousands of pipelines that are running every day. So here comes also the, the monitoring and measuring. At the end of the day, we really need to be alerted if something in the pipeline changed, something broke, or some results are not looking correctly. So this is all an initiative to really bring, bring us to improve our accuracy of the, of the end results that we are getting and to improve the whole agility of our work, like how we build and deploy new times because it's significantly affecting the delivery time and the time it takes to kick off a new, new analytics project to get the value and feed this information to the, to the end customer. As a path forward, so uh, like these are the cases that we are working on in this year and that will be our main focus for, for, for the years to come. Uh, in, in applying advanced analytics uh, in banking. Personalization is uh, one of the first, uh, is probably something that we are at ThinkSolver are, are working on for the most amount of time. So since the beginning of, uh, of the company, we always worked on personalization use cases. So it, this is the thing that comes naturally to us. But the main idea is to personalize customer experience and boost the sales because uh, at the end of the day, any data project is validated uh, on how much money we are making, how mo much more money we are making, or how, money, how much money we are saving with the analytics project. So in this area, uh, we are referring to use cases that are trying to micro-segment uh, the customer base because it's not easy for a human uh, to handle 1,000 or 100,000 micro-segments to be used in campaigning and then tailor the pers personalized products for such segments. So this is one area that can boost digital sales up to 20 to 30%. So this is something that we uh, showcased in, in with different clients. And the main idea is like we have some results. We have something that is built in some analytics application. Let's integrate that into the app that the bank is using. In our case, it's a digital origination product where basically during the origination product uh, uh, process, we can offer a personalized product to recommend to the customer. Another really interesting use case, uh, especially for banking, is the anti-fraud. Anti uh, so I re all the initiatives that are related to fraud, whether it's internal or, or external, uh, it's one of the most important topics for, for any bank. So here we are putting a lot of effort to, and we have put a lot of effort to bring machine learning to the table. So we can, uh, the main KPI actually that we are trying to uh, take care of here is uh, sh uh, lowering the number of false positives so that the uh, bank officers that are looking into these fraudulent transactions can really lower the number of uh, cases they are, taking, they are looking at because currently they are looking at thousands and only hundreds are, for example, fraudulent. So this is also the way to help them to be more efficient and not overwhelmed with, with their work. Uh, contact center to, to sales center is one of the initiatives that is currently present in, across many industries. Uh, it's also something that we are uh, focusing our analytics on. But basically, if we have a call center with, where the customer comes and they have some question or issue or for whatever reason they come to, we want to use the contact center as the sales center so that the, the contact, uh, contact center support specialist can really offer a new product to the customer or new ser service that could be relevant for the customer and really uh, improve, improve our business. And churn and risk modeling, which is one of the most interesting and from current experience, one of the most challenging tasks to resolve in any industry, not banking. But when it comes to churn, uh, churn modeling, uh, it's, this is the area where we truly need all of the information that is available about a certain customer, about the interactions, about the complaints, about the, the transactions. So this is another uh, focus area of the analysis. So I think churn, from my experience, not talking about the banking here, is one of the uh, most uh, mostly underpriced <laughs> projects where people think like churn prediction is easy and we can hear from people on the market that they are bragging about the uh, great results that in most cases are not, not so it's uh, one of the use cases that people think it's really easy but turns out to be quite, quite difficult. So these are all the areas where machine learning, advanced analytics, data pipelines can really bring value and this is something that we see as the main focus for, for banks to kick off their, their projects, to kick off their 
analytics focus and to start from because at the end of the day this is where the, the value could be showcased uh, to, to the business and really the process could be improved. And f last but not least, of course, <laughs> we are hiring. So if you're looking, if you're looking for, if you think you're a good fit for our team, if you're interested to just have a coffee with us, please drop us an email. Uh, and yeah, we'll we'll be glad to to discuss. We are currently hiring in Serbia, Bosnia, uh, Macedonia. More more markets will follow. So <laughs> this is the main focus for for the years to come for me and my team. Yep, that's it for me. Any questions? Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, Miloš, you said that uh, there is a problem with the talent in uh, Serbia. Do you have maybe some idea how that can be um, improved, maybe solved? <laughs> well, I, I, uh, I can tell you what we are uh, working on. So this year, I think uh, half of my time went just on talking with the people. So one of the m most important things that we are focusing on at Things Solver during the interview process and talking to the clients is really to explain to the people honestly what we are working on, what type of projects do we have, and what their days at Things Solver will be like. Because I think this is the most important thing when it comes to data, not data, but to the whole IT industry where we have the lack of talent. Because if you hire people and you promise them, they will be working with deep learning, uh, super fancy models, and they end up working in SQL and Excel. That's not good. So no one is happy with such, such situations. So for, from for me, it's really important to be present, to talk to any candidate that we have in the pipeline and to really try to send our strategy, our focus, and try to communicate our culture at the company uh, so that people really can make their, their decision whether they are joining us or not on <laughs> true facts. Uh, our approach is hiring, but also building people because to be completely honest with you here today, when I started uh, the company, the thing solver, I didn't have any experience in data engineering other than I didn't experience that I was working at the faculty and back home. So I never worked for another company other than thing solver. So I truly believe in building people and build, building the, the capabilities. So I think in this year, we had most of the people that we hired uh, are juniors and we invested a lot of time to really make the, to enable them to learn, to put them to, to, to actually to start, to start working with the technologies that we are using and we really believed in the people so they can become a great data scientist, great data engineers and currently the strategy pays off. So I think that's, that's the current thinking at, at ThingSolver, how to overcome this. Of course, we are always hiring for seniors, for people that have prior experience, but still it, that is the, the difficult part, like finding such people in the market because there are only a few companies other than things solver that are working in the area seriously here. So that's, that's a great challenge. Thank you. Thank you once again.